Hey everyone, Dr. Z, welcome to the show. Hey, this formula crisis where you're reading on the news that they're having to airlift in formula and, it, and you know kids are ha going without and it's really been stressful for a lot of parents, a lot of kids and a lot of the public that thinks, wow, this seems like a really kind of a, a, a bottleneck in our supply chain. And so I thought, you know, I should probably talk to someone who knows what they're doing. And so I have Marini Rich Richie here. Marini, welcome to the show. Thank you. Did Dr. I say Z. your name right? Mirani Ritchie. Yes. Mirani Ritchie. That's a beautiful name. What's Thank the you. origin? Well, um, I've had folks tell me that it's French origin. My father's family is from southern Louisiana. My my mother's family is from the deep south also. And my parents were theater majors. So Wow. So it's basically like Les Mis, but with breast milk and formula, because you're also a <laughs> internationally certified. How do you say this? So I know it's a mouthful. International Board Certified Lactation Consultant or Ooh. IBCLC. 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 So how did, how did you get into that? So I did my, uh, my undergrad in health science, always been interested in health and nutrition, and started my first public health job working at a county health department working with new parents. And I wasn't doing breastfeeding or feeding, but I was doing more like helping them with newborn care, preparing for birth, preparing to be parents, making sure they're getting to all their appointments at the clinic. Um, and then what I found is I'd form these bonds with them in the clinic and then they'd keep calling me and all that they would ask questions about breastfeeding. They would ask me questions that I didn't even know could be a question. So I'm like, I need to learn more. So while I was working on my master's degree in public health, uh, I started working on my IBCLC credential as well, which they take about the same amount of time. Ah, okay. Okay. And this is the thing that mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this off camera. I have been publicly, I've made videos kind of mm -hmm. poking fun at the more aggressive lactation consultants that mm -hmm. may be in the hospital and new moms who are all emotional. They're they're thinking, you know, I, I want to do the right thing for my baby. And we know that, you know, a lot of data around breastfeeding says that it is quite positive. You'll teach me about it. But what's interesting is many mothers have fed back to me, including my own wife that they, in this state of emotional vulnerability, they felt pressured, they felt shamed, they felt stressed about the obligation that they felt to breastfeed when yeah. it just wasn't clicking for them. And they often would lay that on, say, the lactation consultant. So I made a couple parody videos about this. I had Doc Vader talk about it. But then I talked to you, you're in our supporter tribe, yeah. and you have such a nuanced and brilliant take on how to feed kids and take care of moms that I was just really excited to have you on. So let's just go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Where, where to start? Well, first I did bring you a gift from my university. I work at Florida State University. I did bring you a, yes. a gift that I give out at all of my, I only train healthcare providers is what I do. I don't deal with students. I'm in a really amazing role as research faculty and I just train healthcare providers. So I always like to bring something to trainings um, as a visual aid. So I did bring you um, a stress breast. Oh <laughs> my gosh. This is where all the ads get stripped from my YouTube video because <laughs> booby. Booby. <laughs> so this is a, okay. First of all, I want to say mm -hmm. you are so incredibly woke for a Floridian that you brought me a brown <laughs> breast. Okay. It because it, it Matt, look, look, Almost matches yeah. my skin tone. Second of all, this is a stress ball, so I can squeeze it with impunity Absolutely. without criminal charges. Ab and I encourage you to do so. <laughs> so why do you give this out? It's amazing. So uh, originally we started giving those out at the beginning of COVID because uh -huh. I had to take all of my lectures and trainings onto Zoom. Ah. And normally in a classroom environment, I've got some really great props with some some different things to, to palpate, some plug ducts and all the things that I teach in my course. But we, those are very expensive and we, we teach a lot of people. So I like, I want to give them something because I'll tell you why there's absolutely no way to talk about breastfeeding. If you don't have a prop in your hand, someone's going to start grabbing themselves. <laughs> and it's true. Test my theory. And that can make people uncomfortable. It doesn't bother me in the work that I do, but. I mean, uh, I went right to the nipple the minute you said that. Exactly. I, I, yeah. You wow. can't stop it. So, and if you're working with clients, uh -huh. this can, uh, and you've got mom and dad in the room and you start trying to demonstrate on yourself. Um, so I give these out for fun uh, for a few reasons. Number one, um, I 
I do represent all the breast colors in my training. Ah. Uh, number two, I do give a, a pretty hardy exam at the end of my course that may stress you out. So now you've got a tool for stress. <laughs> but also now you, when you go back and work with your clients, you've got at least some kind of prop if you didn't have anything at your office. This before. makes perfect sense, strangely. <laughs> and also I get to say, breast side, because this is amazing. And, um, it, and it's got our logo from the university and our website on the bottom. So that you're at FSU. I'm at Florida okay, State we'll University. We'll put some uh, links to your stuff at the end of the show. Okay, okay. so now I've got the breast. You do. Um, let's, let's go down the rabbit hole. Okay. You, you know, nutrition and babies, we have this formula mm -hmm. crisis. Where to begin? So first of all, I... I as an IBCLC, it kind of goes with the territory that some of the, but you've kind of alluded to making fun with, which I take <laughs> absolutely no offense to because I've known those IBCLCs. Um, but I think uh, originally when the profession was evolving, it was a lot of nurses who had worked in that field for a long time. And so as it's evolved, uh, you don't have to be a nurse. I'm not an RN. I had to do a lot of the core work classes to become an IBCLC, but my master's degree is in public health. So we've seen a diversity in the field that we had not seen initially, initially strictly like RNs all the way. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they came from a different place. Whereas now we've got social workers and counselors and public health folks joining the IBCLC ranks. And so we all bring a different lens. I primarily train providers who work with the most severely at risk, socioeconomically, ah. health department um, clients, WIC clients, um, teenage parents. So I work primarily with providers who work with that population. And um, personally, I, you know, I, I was um, married in a, in a relationship. Our children were planned. Uh, we planned for the time off I would take so that I could be home and be support, you know, and su get support and all these things. But that is not the majority of the population anymore. So to kind of throw out one blanket recommendation is great. And, and I'm 100 percent obviously behind breast milk for infants because of all of the, you know, immune properties and nutritional benefit. But the verb breastfeeding not, it's not always for everybody and it's not always possible. And so I think that I am seeing the profession come along with recognizing some of these nuances. I think, you know, it's probably like any field where you're going to see extremes um, in the group, but mine is, is very much, I want to get away from the formula breast milk debate because it's divisive. Uh, a lot of it's because of the marketing done by formula companies. Ooh. They're very bright. They know Ooh. how to plant those seeds. Big formula. Big formula. <laughs> big. They're like big pharma. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're essentially the same model. Right. Um, so then, you know, just like, how about we don't talk about either of that? How about we talk about what's best for the infant in terms of the nutrition? And that brings a whole other debate and a whole other realm of conversation that isn't really being had too much outside of maybe like lactation circles. Wow. So, okay. So many things there to un- Ravel. One is the social social determinants of health issue that you really do. It really becomes an equity issue when you're pushing something that has no support outside of the hospital. Like you said, if you're a single mom and you're doing all this stuff and you don't have the social support and the time off and the so on, how can you maintain easy breastfeeding? It, many physicians have trouble with it because there's no places sometimes to pump, even in the hospital. Residents have trouble with it. It's getting better, but it's still yeah. a big problem. And what are your thoughts on the kind of support structures around that? And then we can talk about, uh, you know, this idea of formula versus uh, uh, breastfeeding and whether that's, you know, I personally like Three Musketeers for children, for infants. It's got creamy nougat, which is one of the essential vitamins mm -hmm. that uh, children need. So back to you. Yeah, and um, you know, you can get them without the nuts, which we know you shouldn't <laughs> give. <laughs> Newborns. Um, first, I do one of those. See, say, science. Science. Boobs plus science. Boobs plus science equals. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> so I do want to acknowledge, though, with a lot of sympathy, what you and your wife must have gone through with your with your child or children. L well, let's be honest. It was mostly it was me. Most, it was mostly, it was mostly me. You. I mean, my wife, you know, she was there, but I was the one suffering. You know, right, because you had honest. to watch the whole thing unfold and had no control over it whatsoever. And every time I'd go to my phone to distract myself, I'd get pulled back into the drama. Right, and you didn't have any outlet for your stress. 
Yeah. So no, no, but it was it was very hard. For it her. is hard, yeah. and I think especially and and there has you know there is research to support that especially amongst women who with higher education, um, higher socioeconomic status, higher education, they're putting a lot more pressure on themselves, uh, right? Because they know this is what I should be doing. Um, but all the policies in the world can't make it a reality for everybody. And that's where we're really losing our grip. Mm. Um, because what do we do? We we tell women and we promote breastfeeding as we should for the entire pregnancy. And we're setting them up for failure. Oh, so it's like an unfunded mandate. You're saying this is what you really need to do if you it's wanna really be a good mom. To, to have a healthy baby and to be a good mother and for your own health. Cause your we know health, there's right? benefits for the, there's, for the mother as well. So, so let, quickly, actually let, let, let's hit those benefits for the mom. Sure. So there's a contraceptive benefit, right? To breastfeeding? There is. Well, it suppresses your estrogen levels um, to produce the, the lactation hormones, which will suppress ovulation. Um, and in many parts of the world, there is no family planning methods. There's no birth control. So they do use lactation. They Are we talking about Texas? Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Florida. Uh, so the, the recommendation is if you're exclusively breastfeeding, there's no pacifiers, there's no bottles, 24-7 um, access, right? All the sucking needs are happening on the mom. She, the baby is still less than six months old and she hasn't got her menses back. Uh -huh. There's like 2% chance of getting pregnant in that first six months. So it is very cost effective, especially in countries that don't have access to family planning. See, and that's something we don't talk mm -hmm. about that much in public circles, mm -hmm. uh, that that's a that's a real advantage. And it's actually a bigger advantage, like you said, in the communities that are most at risk. Right. Um, so, okay, so other advantages for mom. Uh, so we've we've all heard kind of the, the saying that, that sucking the calcium right out of mom to produce milk. And while that's somewhat true, what happens is she gets such an increase of bone remineralization oh. that our bones are actually stronger going into postmenopause if we have breastfed um, because of that process that happens. So we've got stronger bones. So there, there's some dynamic flux of calcium bone remineralization, mm -hmm. breastfeeding that is there data to support this? There is. Oh, there wow. Is. Huh. I, don't, I can't cite it off the top of no, my head, but yes. We leave that for Vinay Prasad. Well, we, He's a yes, yeah, nerd. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you no, that, look that, that up for me. Okay, um, so bone bone density. Bone density. Mm -hmm. So also because you're suppressing your estrogen levels for months uh, on end, oh, right. we're also seeing decreased risk of breast cancer. Ah. Not with those who carry the, the BRCA gene, mm. but the, the kind of the environmental factors that go into breast cancer. So we see lower risks of breast cancer. And I believe the data says like we're edging now towards uh, 20 months to two years worth of breastfeeding, not all at one time, but over your I see area child under the curve. Years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're suppressing some estrogen, lowering that that risk of breast cancer, also reducing the risk of ovarian cancer as well. Interesting. Is there is there a weight benefit to breastfeeding or no that we know of? In terms of, in terms of maternal weight loss after pregnancy. Uh, well, it burns about 500 calories a day just Dude, sitting there. I want to do this. Could you That's I'm like telling you it's not an a elliptical bad diet for time. an hour. That's like spin class exactly for an hour is wow. what I used to say. So, I mean that of course that can vary. Um that's that's an average, but and also making sure that it does make you hungrier to right, lactate. Right. So a lot right. of women will make up for those calories and not see the weight loss right, or, right, or right. Uh, you know, other factors. But yeah, you're burning like 500 calories a day, just mobilizing everything to, to and which is you need ex more extra calories in lactation than you do to even sustain a pregnancy. Wow. Is that really? Wow. Yeah. So it's 390 to 450, depending on the stage of the pregnancy. Extra. Uh -huh. Oh, extra in pregnancy. Extra to grow the right. fetus mm -hmm. and around 500 or so. And I've seen, you know, again, varying degrees because it depends on- Who you are and the different metabolism. Yeah. But that's like an average. So that's that's pretty cool benefit yeah, for a lot yeah. of women. Your uterus shrinks down back into uh, pre-pregnancy state, back down is, lower. Is that because pelvis. of oxytocin? And... That's because of the oxytocin. Oh, okay. Science. Science. Wow. So we're, we're seeing decreased uh, postpartum bleeding because it's clamping that uterus down. Uh, so it's going to shrink that back down, which does help to, to flatten out the belly a little bit as well. Yeah, my uterus is a big part of my gut. Um, that's what I'm sticking with that story. So, so you have those benefits to mom now for child because again, we're, I think we can establish the benefits of breastfeeding for children. 
and mom, but then we wanna get into the nuance of, first of all, you know, what are the obstructions? We've talked about some of them, and then what are the alternatives? And then is there a synthesis position? And then what's been the role of the formula industry in all of this? So for, for, for baby, um, I understand you cannot get into Harvard if you're formula fed. It is, it is a instant, you just, you don't form the neural connections or you don't form the legacy connections, the nepotism, and there's other aspects that will get you into Harvard. So what, but this is literally what some women have been made to feel that my kid is gonna end up on the street intellectually, physically, right. if I don't breastfeed, but what are the actual Is this documents? why I'm this age and I'm still a doctoral student? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get there. Uh, and I'm at a state university, so <laughs> not at Harvard. <laughs> you know what? It's it's overrated. My wife went to Harvard. I, I am at least 30 standard deviations dumber than her. <laughs> um, and that has nothing to do with Harvard. So um, so yeah, so why why are, because it is that perception mm -hmm. that breastfeeding, breast is best, that's sure. the slogan. So just tell me more about this. So a lot of the, the brain studies, first of all, have been on preterm infants. So we oh. know that those little brains are already higher risk because they were underdeveloped when at the time of birth. So then they're seeing... Um, you know, vision problems and some of the other problems that we see with preterm infants. So a lot of the brain studies have been done around preterm infants. So we know that it can, the, uh, I think it's like a 10 point IQ difference, but that was based on preterm ah, infants. Important, yeah. Important yeah. distinction because they, they, like you said, they're the most vulnerable the and they may not be, mm -hmm. that may not be a scalable result to a, a full-term infant, but right. keep, keep, yeah, keep telling me. And so um, another component of breast milk is, you know, living hormones. So you don't get mm. that um, in a manufactured product. So you've got um, oxytocin and you've got these other, you know, hormones and you've got the other things going on from the mom's system. Antibodies? Antibodies. Yeah. Um, enzymes. Um, but the thing that I used to love teaching my young parents about is part of it too is the connection. And you can't uh -huh. talk about uh, mm. feeding without talking about how it's being done because- mm. Typically, when you're breastfeeding, right, you're holding the baby on this side, and then I'm going to switch this side, and I'm getting this cross-connectivity happening mm -hmm. in the brain. And very few could hold a baby and not talk to it, right? So I'm talking to my baby. I'm switching my baby around. They're getting this great cross-connectivity that we know builds brains. So for my little trick for my uh, bottle-feeding parents, I used to say, you know, don't, don't feed them in the same position all the time. Switch them around. Make sure you're talking to them. Don't prop them in the corner. They need that interaction. Feeding is a hugely receptive time for babies to build their brain. So. Oh, wow. So, okay, I'm really interested in this because I was uh, reading Ian McGilchrist's book, uh, The Master and His Emissary, about the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And they've actually done studies on cultural norms of where babies tend to be fed more or held mm -hmm. more commonly. And what the, 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 the visual field that the baby is seeing the mother's face in is determined by which side they're on, obviously, but then which lobe, which hemisphere of the brain actually is doing that processing is the opposite of which field they're looking at. So that side of the brain that is most relational, most emotionally intelligent, most silent, the right side is often is associated with left visual field and vice versa. So this idea, that you're not preferring, you're creating a balance or a more equitable distribution. Mm -hmm. I've never heard that. Oh, and should take my course. <laughs> I need, I'm doing it now, this is great. Right. And, and, and it's fascinating to me because if you're really talking, and, and what you said was important, I tell my formula feeding parents this. So this is not exclusive to breastfeeding, but it's more natural because you do switch breasts. Right, yeah. and, and not even to say just formula feeding parents, there is an increasing number of women who pump exclusively. Ah, yes. But by choice or circumstance, and they pump and give uh, bottled um, expressed milk for the whole you know, for the whole duration. So the advice is switch up the side switch that you're, it up. and this is important for dads because Absolutely. I mean, so the, my wife used to pump, I would be, then deliver the breast milk and uh, boy, I'm trying to remember now, I think it was often whatever is the, that comfortable sure. side and it would be static. Interesting. Yeah. And and that's, you know, we're retired parents where you find the one spot and the baby's going out and you don't want to mess things up either. And so, you know, I think that's not, for bottle feeding, it wouldn't come second nature like it would with direct breast I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And uh, so th then, okay, so you have that advantage. Now we're talking about kid. We're talking about baby. L I, one question I wanted to ask before I forget, 
cost wise, mm -hmm. and we may get to that eventually, but is there a big differential between the pumping equipment, the bottles, all of that, that you might do if you're doing pumping and actual breastfeeding mm -hmm. versus formula in terms of cost? Yeah, and I, I've seen a lot of criticism of that statement online. Of the data. Oh, breastfeeding's free and easy. Ah, uh, It's uh, not easy. It's not and, easy. Uh, and nothing is free. Nothing is free. <laughs> right. Okay, so yes, $1,800 a year, you're going to spend that over at uh, CVS buying formula, um, along with the bottles and, and everything else. And a lot of parents will- you but know, you're going to save it. You're going to save it on Harvard tuition because they're not going to Harvard going because to Harvard. they've gotten formula, which is poison. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that. Research. I'm just trying to make you. I'm trying to make you as uncomfortable as I can. Uh, no, no, no. So, so you're going to spend a, what? How much was it? Eighteen hundred. About eighteen hundred. Yeah, I think yeah. is the current average. Right. Um, now, if you're a participant in the Women Infant Children Program or WIC, yeah, it's supplemented. They we don't give them everything. Right. Um, but it does greatly reduce their their cost to the family. You know, there was a, there was a line rapper, Bay Area rapper E-40 once used talking about growing up in a bad social, socioeconomic status. Um, and he says something like, a jack for Similac, meaning, you know, he's robbing people yeah. to pay for the formula to feed his child. Well, that was the one, backtracking a little bit to what I did my master's research, re research in was actually pandemic preparedness, obvious, uh, funny enough, but oh. specifically the disaster piece. And I focused on women and infants and pregnancy. And what I saw post Katrina, for example, hurricane come from the hurricane belt is the first thing to get looted from the stores as infant formula. Oh yeah. First thing. Of course. Cause you're terrified. Yeah. And like right now, right now. which we're going to get to, but yeah. yeah. So, so, okay. So cost advantage cost. is, is what's the controversy on the data? So <laughs> I think the controversy is that Yes, it, it technically I can have a baby and produce milk and it's not an actual monetary cost. However, we don't give paid parental leave in this country. Mm. So we know women, most women who want to be long term successful at breastfeeding and work, they're going to have to get a pump. Yeah. Um, now, they're being covered more and more by insurance companies. But a few hundred gotta, bucks, right? Few, several hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, you got to replace parts on occasion. Uh, you may have to switch it up, and then you've got to. You're still buying bottles because you have to deliver the milk back to the baby. The um, you know some would argue the economic burden of the female going back into the workplace as a pumping mom that that has some impact on her long term <coughs> success. I won't get into that kind of stuff, but I mean just because I couldn't tell you any research on it, but that's certainly. Something as most women would tell you, yeah, it was a real hardship mm. trying to get space to pump. Um, so I kind of had to ditch it. Oh, wow. So there is there's the, the social impacts um, on that as well. But <coughs> excuse me, COVID. Oh. Um. <laughs> From Florida, my gift to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, so <laughs> the, the social the social impact, th these are kind of area under the curve costs that right. we policymakers think about. Someone with a master's in public health like yourself thinks right. about these things. The general public doesn't often appreciate these, but they experience them. Right. And, and so that's why it's so important when you talk about this nuance. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm noticing, even as we're talking, the kind of self, I'm self-reflecting on how I'm interviewing right now you. Mm -hmm. And what I'm realizing is I'm kind of going back to making these look silly jokes and interrupting yeah. you and doing this thing. Now, why is that? I, I may not do that with... Everybody, right? Right. So is this topic innately uncomfortable I for men? I think so, which is yeah. another reason I break out the breast first thing. Let's yeah. just desensitize right now and talk about mm. nipples and areolas and breasts and just like- I'm so uncomfortable. Get all the silliness <laughs> out of the way. No, but it's really, it's re it really is interesting because if we were talking about cancer, the, the tone and the mood and right. everything is a little bit different, but I'm even just meta thinking about how this yeah. conversation goes. And the, the beautiful thing about your own style is you adapt to anything. Like you roll with all that and you do it. It, right. Like you have to adapt to your students, like you have to adapt to mothers. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's a great number of the, the people that attend my course that are not there because they want to be. <laughs> it's a requirement for oh, their particular oh, program. Oh, oh, right. So I get a lot of, uh, and what, what I've, I've got two um, nurses that help me teach. Um, so we kind of take turns just because it's a, a it's a, you know, can be a lot for one person to do, but, um, we have found you, you have to spend the first hour of the class like 
debriefing everyone's trauma because oh, they're wow. everyone's bringing their own bags into the room. I believe it. And you know, <clears throat> my my daughter or my my sister or myself or you know, um, it's they're they're bringing in so much trauma, um, personal guilt. And we got, we got to like unpack it and throw it out so we can move forward with learning. And that is, that's a challenge. It's almost an integration process. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. this happened to you. You honor the experience right. of that, Have to. <clears throat> you integrate it. You're actually quite good at that, you know, because I'm actually coming from the experience where it was very traumatic for right. my wife. And, you know, just even talking to you, I'm like, oh, okay, okay. I don't yeah. have to be so on edge about this. No, not at yeah. all. So, so, so then circling it back to where mm -hmm. we were in that conversation about the benefit to, to infants. The, to the baby. Yeah. Right. So we talk about cost. That's not so much for the baby, although, you know, <laughs> baby's got to get paid. And baby needs toys. Baby needs toys. So, yeah. but for the baby themselves, like do we talk about allergies. Sure. So <clears throat> because, you know, if we start, I want to start thinking about like the microbiome, right? So we've got this kind of clean slate when we're born. We get a little bit through the birthing process to kind of start setting up our immunity. And then if we're getting breast milk into the baby, we're getting passive immunity, whatever mom's been exposed to, whatever mom's been recently vaccinated against. Um, we're getting those antibodies into the baby passively since babies aren't really born with, you know, too much active immunity of their own. Um, also, because of the, you know, differences in every mammal's milk is unique to the species. So human milk uh, is very different in composition from cow milk or goat milk, whale milk, you name it. Cat milk. Cat milk. Have you ever milked a cat? Um, not my cat. She would not let that <laughs> even remotely Can you be imagine? an option. No, yeah. I can't. Yeah. They're very, <laughs> to begin with, they're emotionally distant, but then you start to, you know, you, you go that direction, things get really ugly. Although fast. I did relactate my cat for, to, to an adopt a, an abandoned kitten. Wait, what? How oh, did you yeah. do? You can relactate a cat? You can right, relactate any mammal. If they're coming down off lactation, uh -huh, and then uh -huh. we've got a certain time, we got oh, a certain a window. window that we can kind of recrank the battery. A little oh my gosh! Okay, well, then we may get to that. But okay, so <laughs> so sorry, I derailed you. We were talking about um, the allergies and and the right. nutrition. So for the for the infant, also there's that that actual physical part, right? The holding, right? Um, which of course bottle fed parents can do as well, but all too often. I'll see in public, you'll see it, you know, the baby's in the stroller alone, fill it, feeding himself the bottle. So there's that lack of, cause he can. The skin <laughs> um, to skin. You can't do that with your with your breast. So we've got the skin to skin. Yeah. Which, and, oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Which is, you know, part of that uh, at my center, we do a lot on trauma informed care and infant mental health. Uh -huh. So it, it, you know, there's a benefit in terms of long-term the infant mental health, setting that up when you're being held and responded to that responsive care as we call it. I love it. You know, Alexander and Alexandra West, who was on my show talking about uh, uh, issues around abortion and equity mm -hmm. and things like that, is an expert in trauma informed care. Mm -hmm. And so, I would love we, we should definitely dive into that at some point. And and um, I'm going to probably have her back to talk about that. One thing I did derail you on was the <clears throat> you were talking about the difference in mammalian and mammalian breast milk right. in terms of allergies and things like that. Right. So with, with human milk and any new parent will tell you, it goes in one in and out the other. It is yeah. rapidly digested. Yeah. Um, and that's- It's because, a different kind of poop too, right? Like oh it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's like super yellow. Yeah. CD, it, maybe like a little bit of like spicy mustard mixed in with some sesame seeds. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting <laughs> notes of corn with- uh... <laughs> And you know, sometimes you see a little bit of green in there. I mean, it's, it's a rainbow. Um, <laughs> but that's true. We I mean, we're not joking. We obsessive about the di the, checking- the, They the sure do. We, yeah, we I remember do. this. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. and, and vividly. So, <laughs> um, and that's because the like way to casein ratio in human milk, milk proteins. Yeah, so the, it's mostly whey, which kind of rips right through. Yeah, oh. um, so there's that digestibility. So it's very easy on the infant GI tract. Got it. To take in um, human milk, uh, so there's it's setting that up. It's very easy to digest. It's a lot of water, so they're they're. You know, they're staying hydrated, very little yeah. risk of contamination. Um, you know, even, most viruses don't pass through breast milk. Um, Got it. Bacteria doesn't pass through breast milk, um, with very few exceptions. Um, very few viruses do. But uh, so it's, it's a feral, a, a fairly sterile product as well. So D does HIV pass through breast milk? It, it, the, yeah, we'll have to, we'll, yeah, that one Dr. we'll have Monica to. Dr. Monica on that one. But yeah. technically, yes. 
but the risk doesn't come from the feed itself. The risk comes when, so in this country, we say, if you're going to, if you have HIV and you're pregnant and you're going to breastfeed, the recommendation is don't breastfeed. Oh. Use infant formula because it's sustainable, right? I mm. see, I see. Maybe not right now, it's not. Right. Um, in other countries, the recommendation is exclusive breastfeeding. So wildly opposite. Wow. Because the minute you start putting any extra supplement into a baby's stomach, there can be what? It's called like these like micro lacerations of the gut. So oh. that's what's allowing the HIV virus to pass through and permeate the infant gut. Whereas if it's strictly exclusive breastfeeding, the risk is actually pretty low. How interesting. So, it, and of course, I mean, there would have to be also a cut on the lip of sure. the baby if the if the mother has some mastitis or some open- Open bleeding nipples. Bleeding nipple, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which can happen, yeah. And that could be the same with, with um, hepatitis C, theoretically. But again, it's um, there's not a lot of, of cases right. that are documented, not in the United States anyway. But right. And so they've introduced like field flash pasteurization in some other countries, Oh, which- Kills HIV virus Whoa. too. It's like a double, you know, a double safety net there. So you pump, you pasteurize, mm -hmm. and then you feed the baby. Feed the baby. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, okay. No, one quick thing before I forget: you're you're <clears throat> you're pumping, and you've got it in a bottle, or you're using formula. Mm -hmm. How do you mimic that that closeness mm -hmm. of breast? You already talked about switching sides. Mm -hmm. Switch sides. What hold else? Hold the you baby do? close. Hold talk the baby. to the baby. Uh huh. Um, don't hold the bottle kind of up. We want to hold it parallel to the floor. They uh, got to work on it because one of the other infant benefits is oral uh, motor development. Yeah, because it is a lot harder to bring milk down a breast than it is out of a bottle. So we could see a lot better oral and speech and tooth placement development with breastfeeding. Um, so one of the kind of ways you can kind of get around that if you're bottle feeding, hold that bottle parallel. The baby has to move move it down. They're having to pull out the milk rather than having it kind of drip in their mouth. Oh, that's an interesting pro tip. So, yeah. and and so that that reminds me of a question that often mm -hmm. comes up, this tongue tie thing. Tongue tie thing. Yeah, do you wanna dive into sure, that? Sure, I can dive into I that. I like to derail you, but these are just questions that seem to come up r repeatedly. That's okay, I mean, yeah. and I get a lot of the same questions as well. Uh, so tongue tie is where the, you know, the frenulum underneath the tongue, the little string, yours looks pretty good. No formal training. No formal. Yeah. <laughs> I can spot a tongue tie on a grown up like down the hall though. Really? It's an odd um, skill to have. Be like, wow. ooh, I bet your mom did not appreciate that at birth. Wow. Because if the, the tongue has to protrude and go down and out over the lip um, underneath the areola to really move the milk down, they're moving it down with the movement of the tongue. And so a baby who can't stick their tongue out, they're just gnawing oh, on the, the nipple moms complain right. of. Um, cracked bleeding nipples, pain. We've got uh, uh, now we've gotten a, a jaundice baby who's not peeing and pooping and starting not to gain weight and or even lose weight. Wow! Because they're not actually being able to transfer. Mm. They can't transfer the milk. Wow! So and it can also you know it can happen up top as well. Um, usually when I would catch a baby in the clinic, um, I had a, a actually a dentist that I worked closely with. I preferred his method to some of the surgical options that were in town because he used laser, easy easy and clean, and baby was you know able to nurse pretty fast right afterwards. Do you need to do it every time or is it one of those things where it's like, well, if they're having symptoms or something's happening? You don't have to do yeah. it every time. And there's, you know, as with anything, if you're assessing it, there's degrees of it. Mm -hmm. So some babies, it's just super severe. Some babies, it's like, yeah, that doesn't look like it would work, but hey, look at that baby yeah, go. So and don't... mom's not complaining, baby's thriving. A dentist might argue that though. Yeah, cause because I've heard they, some um, people overdo these things, yeah. They would probably argue <laughs> more in favor mm -hmm. in many um, times because the tongue has to hold the right place in the palate to help with the tooth development. I see. So I found that the dentist I referred to, um, he, I don't think ever disagreed with me. Whereas sometimes if I would send him to a surgeon uh -huh. or an ENT, yeah. um, sometimes the mom would be told, it's not. It's not bad. I see. So I yeah. think it, it's a difference. It's in, a difference in style and, and and what, what your uh, what your background and your interest is. So uh -huh. a dentist is like thinking about the tooth and tooth development and right. how that's going to look later. Right. Of course. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Uh, okay. 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 So we were talking about um, 
some other advantages for infants. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit. So is is there an improvement in say allergy development with kids who are breastfeed statistically as an association? Yes. There is. Yes. And a decreased risk of allergy, um, <clears throat> decreased risk of asthma, mm. decreased risk of inner ear infections. Mm. Some of that is that, again, that high powered suction that's happening during the feeding, maybe keeping opening those the station tubes. Ah, keeping them clear. Interesting. Yeah. So a lot of the benefits are from the actual physical work of it, mm -hmm. and some are from the actual components of the milk. How come we can't create a bottle that uh, mimics some of the physical eff uh, effort? There's many companies out there that would tell you theirs does, uh -huh, of and course. they're they're not telling the truth. I, see. I used to get that question a lot from parents. You know, which one is like? And there's even a bottle shaped like that. Mm -hmm. it, does it contain beer or milk? Because I don't know, but yeah. it doesn't contain anything that's going to help. Them. I see. <laughs> so they have an actual nipple shaped bottle. They I mean, have a breast areola, shaped breast bottle. Shaped bottle. Mm -hmm. And it's again, it's not the shape, right? Yeah. Because a woman uh, or you know a female that's maybe even had most of her breast removed right. may still have milk ducts. It's not necessarily a round, full structure. Right. So right. it's not the shape, which is where a lot of the gimmicks come into place on those silly bottles. Um, it's the nipple, where the nipple lands relative to the soft palate uh -huh. versus a bottle which lands in the hard palate. Uh -huh. So we've got a difference in that. Even if you've seen bottles with like really long nipples, it's it's not quite the same. Wow. So we still haven't been able to mimic mother nature in that way. No. Wow. Okay. Okay. This no. is. Um, but again, through just some like pro tips, and even though I am a lactation consultant, you know, my concern is making sure baby is fed. Right. And that mom and baby are happy. <laughs> right. Because the emotions that come along with that are palpable. Yeah. And a stressed out mom, and, you know, and, and I, I hear it a lot. Oh, you know, but there's the mental health thing. And some people are like, oh, you know, but the, the milk is more important. They're both. How, They're, how you can't separate it. The, the infant and the mom are interwoven. Yeah. So if mom has got you know postpartum depression, is feeling terrible right. about not being able to uh, do this or that, it, it does become a thing. And I've Absolutely. had a lot of like passionate emails from mothers who felt very let down. Right. Um, because again, we we have all of these wonderful frameworks and policies promoting breastfeeding and telling you how good it is. And then we're like, and good luck with that. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, there's no bottle that can mimic a nipple properly. And your know, mom's just like, you could, tears are coming right. down. And right. but, but, but but your point is because it's a synergy, making sure the child is fed, Absolutely. is gaining proper weight, and that the mother and that the duo is happy is important. It's very happy. I mean, it, it. We know now, you know, through research, we know the impact of stress hormone on a developing fetus. Mm. It impacts brain development. Mm. Uh, that increase uh, sustained cortisol levels. Why do we think that stops the minute the baby comes out? <laughs> it, that that impact of, right. of stress and prolonged stress absolutely impacts the infant. And and it leads to adult chronic disease, we think. I mean, if an adverse childhood experience, mm -hmm. a real trauma can lead to, a, you know, increased association with mm -hmm. with, with um, diabetes and obesity and heart disease. Well, why right. wouldn't chronic stress in that way Maternal do the same Maternal stress. Thing? And, you know, yeah. there's that old saying, Southern saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's research-based. <laughs> it's science. That <laughs> is evidence-based. Evidence-based. Also, also is happy wife, happy life. That is also <laughs> evidence-based. I, I have, I have <laughs> one data point, and it's 100% consistent. Um, very significant p-value. So yeah. so, so this this interface, so then, other, well, let, okay, let's just make sure there's no other benefits you that you really want to say, okay, here's the benefits of breast because you were trying to be complete. Anything else on the breast side? I, I would say, you know, with extraordinarily rare exception, lactating is good for women. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's physically good for them. Breast milk is best, not even best, normal. Normal, yeah. <laughs> for optimal, for the infant. Right. It's the verb in between that that, that messes us up. Feeding, breastfeeding. It's the feeding. Uh, it's it's the it's the you know it's the active thing got it. um, on the part of the mother or the infant. But you know, I really feel very strongly, and I think there's enough research out there for me to say breast milk is always best. Right. But then it becomes oh well, not all women can breastfeed, and it's like, but that's not what I said. Ah. Right. The milk 
with very little question and very little exception, is best for the nutritional needs, the developmental needs. Of a mammal such the as us. Yeah. long-term immunity um, that we are, the, the immune system that we're setting up, absolutely. So then, you know, then we get some slick marketing and some very pervasive, uh, divisive marketing techniques that my statement does, let me tell you, there is nothing like being a lactation consultant at a cocktail party. I don't want to, you don't want to admit what you do because <laughs> all of a sudden you're going to have a lot of people who will automatically assume yeah. that I have something negative to say about their feeding experience right? and will, you know, kind of make a, a judgment. Um, it's like, you know, I do a, a lot more teaching as the, when I was in the clinic and I would see them for, you know, months on end, a lot more teaching about formula than I did about breastfeeding Yeah, <laughs> because that, that was the reality. Well, you know, it strikes me and I know this because feeling into it myself, it's a, <clears throat> It's a projection of our own shame, guilt, anger, mm -hmm. that we want to find a scapegoat for it. Right. And because we're we're feeling this way for all the reasons, and some of it is the marketing, some of it is all the stuff that you said that's so right. divisive, some of it is our own um, holding ourselves to this ridiculously right. impossible standard, and we want to find a good boogeyman. And every now mm -hmm. and again, the boogeyman lives up to the name, and when it's a, a sure. sh very shamey kind of not not the right. best trained person, but in but like. So, so that's a lot of baggage for you going it into a, a cocktail, lot of cocktail party. Yeah, it, you know. So then for a while, I'm like, oh no, I, I do pandemic planning. Oh no, now I can't say now that. Now you either. can't even say that. So, um, like, what do you think about masks? Right. Well, what do you, why are oh we getting gosh. twelve boosters? Right. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yes. So now I'm back to I'm gonna be a lactation consultant. <laughs> <laughs> it's less stress. Exactly. Less because less, 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 at least most people, especially if they don't have children, they just don't want to talk to me at all. Because yeah. they're like, oh. A lady who talks about breasts. Yeah, I'm talk out. To me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm so uncomfortable. I'm like, I've got my, I look at my body language. I'm like hiding. <laughs> so, okay, okay. So now let's kind of dive into, because we talked about, okay, breast milk is best. You talked about the verb breastfeeding being mm -hmm. problematic, the right. divisive component. Now let's go to this alternatives. Let's talk about alternatives to breast milk itself as opposed to breastfeeding first. Right. So AKA formula, yeah? Right. Yeah. Right, so, and of course, you know, it's been on the news. I saw it on your local news this morning, a whole shipment being flown into LA today. So formula has been the acceptable alternative since, I mean, my mom who's in her seventies, there wasn't formula available. And I, my grandmother, I remember her telling me that she had problems. Back then they didn't really even know what the problem was. Um, and that there wasn't formula. So she's making it in the kitchen with the K-Row syrup and the milk, you know, and the I whole see. thing. So that's how they would do just kind of You just figured whip it, it out. out. Yeah. Or if unless your cousin was uh lactating and and there was the the you know, the like casual a wet nurse scenario. Absolutely. Yeah. That was very common and still very common in other parts of the world. Mm. But, you know, then formula came into play, which had the benefit of being standardized. It's mm. uh historically less likely to be at risk for bacteria okay obviously recently you know yeah but we'll talk it's about a food that product yeah. right so yeah. but yeah. more so than you know grandma's kitchen right uh, a little more controlled steady with the vitamins etc um and in the u.s we've typically oh well we've only had cow milk based so again cow milk protein very different from human milk protein it's different ratio of whey and casein mostly casein which uh. is that slow to digest the harder to digest, right? Um, so that's why people are like, oh, if I give my baby a little formula, man, he sleeps for like yeah. four hours. Which is kind of awesome for the mom in theory. In theory, yeah. not really good, not biologically the norm for the infant. Uh, need periodic and frequent waking, uh, uh, um, protective against SIDS. Uh, uh, sudden infant does to have that frequent waking, but also digestively, you know, it can be hard to digest. So along the, the years, they've started adding things, um, doing different things to the proteins. There's intact protein formula, but then there's like hydrolyzed where they kind of mush it up. Um, you know, so they've, they've come up with different ways to try to make infants as comfortable as possible mm. who are on formula. Mm. Um, you know, is that, is that all marketing? Do you think it actually works? No, so it, it it is not marketing. Um, FDA is pretty clear. Well, and not just our FDA, the Codex Alimentarius, is it? The, the Food Code from World Health Organization. Oh. So a part of that, and that's an international standard that 
you have to either, you have to label what is the protein, what is the fat, and what is the carb. You mm. have to label those macros accurately. But what we see in the marketing is the the gentle, the yeah. uh, the little hearts, the comfort proteins. The I saw one the other day. It's got P3. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> like, it's like they're, they're putting, and so parents are like, well, I want that. That's got the extra new and improved P squared or whatever. It's more nougat. More Must nougat. be more nougat, <laughs> supersized, king size nougat. So it leaves parents really confused, which has been a lot of the problem that we're seeing right now. Okay. Because a lot of parents have no idea what's in the can. If you ask a parent, so what kind of formula is your baby on? Oh, you know, the, the one with the red label. But is it an intact protein, hydrolyzed, partially hydrolyzed? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh. They don't know because it's it's the comfort one. Mm, I mean, that's... It's not a thing. That's a marketing thing. <laughs> ah, of course. Um, but, and you tell me when when you want to get into why we allow that in this mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. But in other countries, so what we're seeing coming over right now as our relief uh-huh. is goat milk based. Oh heck, right? Yeah. Which that's going to be a change. Parents over here are just like freaked out about it. It's like that's been. Um, pretty popular in other countries for quite a long time. Ah. I personally was given goat milk as a child. And look. And look at me now. You have such lustrous hair. <laughs> <laughs> Bad. <laughs> so so what uh, is the main difference between the goat milk and the cow milk? Is it the protein makeup? It's a little bit of yeah. the protein difference. Um, you know, some would argue the goat milk is healthier. Uh, the way the Goats are actually raised in other countries is a little different from cattle farming. Yeah. So there's a lot of those nuances. At the end of the day, goat milk is for baby goats and cow milk is for baby cows <laughs> and humans make little human baby milk. human milk. So it's still a foreign protein. Right. Um, but, you know, but again, and back to kind of what I teased uh, before we start talking is why are we still talking about formula when there's other alternatives that are probably better for okay. the infant. Okay, okay. So now I'm trying to think, what do we talk about next? Do we talk about those other alternatives? Because now now you've teased it. We got to talk yeah. about it. Then we'll go back to why we're in the mess we're in with okay. formula. Maybe the, the marketing stuff that goes on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Does that sound good? Yeah. So yeah. first, I, I would say that for right now, um, for most parents who decide or can't or don't want to breastfeed, formula is the alternative unless they want to pump. But, you know, I've dealt with children in foster care system, Mm. children with parents who are deceased, Mm. uh, children whose mothers were on various substances. So, you know, the pumping thing isn't even an option for everyone. So then formula, of course, and for those who just prefer it, maybe that's just what they want to do. Great. But we've had very limited options in this country. Um, eh, There's still soy formula, but it's not really recommended. But sometimes that's for families who maybe have like um, cultural or personal. With milk. Vegan. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the downside of the soy? Um, It's not a, it's not the right protein Mm. mix. Mm. Um, It doesn't have, I'm trying to remember all the chemistry. It doesn't have all the amino acids so that they have to add some Mm -hmm, in. mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of Parents think, oh, well, I'm allergic to milk or I'm lactose intolerant. So So I'll eat soy. I see. Soy's a really big allergen too. I see, I see, I see. But it's vegan, bro. It's vegan. Yeah. So is human milk. Just saying. Is human milk milk vegan? I don't think. What's the definition of vegan? It can't, like you can't cast a shadow or something. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I think that's like, you're not consuming an animal product. Oh, that's true. But if it's your own self. Cannibalism is vegan. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So, so sorry. So soy. So we were back, back to formula. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So now we're seeing some new formulas. See, come in. now I know you're in my supporter tribe because we get derailed with just ridiculous stuff. I know, like, yeah, because that's what we do on our shows. I'm gonna start talking about cat lactation any moment. Milk a cat. <laughs> that is not a foreign protein for many who have owned cats because we're inhaling their, you know, horrible excrement. We're at one with the dander. Oh yes, for sure. Oh yes. I am. Um, I will just as a funny little side note that when my children were little and they had to listen to this stuff all the time, <laughs> upside being, this is very normal discussion That's for That's good, them. yeah, yeah. They're not, they're far from being parents yet, but <laughs> um, hopefully <laughs> it's Florida. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> Deep South. Yeah. Um, so 
I, I remember I'm teaching and sometimes I'd have my kids in tow. They'd be in the back of the class playing game, whatever, having to listen to me when I was working directly with parents. And I would talk about milks. And my youngest said, you know, mommy, it's not almond milk, which is what we drink at home. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, mommy, almonds don't have nipples. <laughs> very true. Very true. Well, that is a smart kid. She's a smart kid. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that aside, just. Um, they could have nipples if we make them GMO enough. Eventually. It, the game is not over yet. The game is not over. Evolution continue. You know what? Life <laughs> finds a way. <laughs> It does find a way, but uh, so we were talking about were formula, talking about? formula, almonds um, and nipples and for okay, formula. formula. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> and a part of the other you know issues is it, really the the problem with infant formula comes down to it's a foreign protein base. Yeah. It's not from our species. I don't care how much comfort this and extra DHA that they want to put in there. It's never going to be the same. It's as close as we've gotten right. in a long time. It's probably saved, I know it's saved many, many children um, in the United States. And, you know, we also have babies who are born with galactosemia. They can't have any human milk. Right. So, you know, we've got these medical formulas that are, we're going to always probably need stuff. Life-saving like stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I just don't see enough argument right now on why are we still putting our infants under the control and the mercy of the formula industry, there's other options that we could be investing in. So you're saying the formula industrial complex mm. or fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> has got a kind of chokehold on these kids who are, who are you, you're not gonna relactate their moms. They're no. out of the, out of the window. And they're gonna make sure of that because they're gonna give you little formula samples oh. before you've even had your baby. Oh. You're gonna pop that can open at three o'clock in the morning when that child is beside itself and the mother is crying and the infant's crying and everyone else in the house is crying. Guilty, we did that. Absolutely, yeah. you're gonna pop open that little can that the hospital was so kind enough yeah. to send you home and it's ready to feed. Oh, you might just pour it, it you in know, the can. It was like baby crack because the minute, this was our oldest, the minute, because she had, she was losing weight mm -hmm. more than what was recommended. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, it was, it was stress and all this. Right. And it was middle of the night. And we said, should we just, we were looking at each other, tears, all this. Feed the baby. And this little thing, this little crack thing, you just open the thing and it, and it went we like this. Brr, right. It was gone. And right. the baby was like, pop, out like a light. Sleeping. because then, yeah. And everybody goes, ah. And then it's like, I can't believe that lactation consultant made us do and this. And she didn't tell us how she easy that was. She didn't tell us how easy this was. It's like, well. And that is what they send you home with at the hospital. Yeah. And if you need it in the hospital, that's what they're going to use. These ready to feed little two ounce miracle jars, right? They're sterile. They're clean. And then for the reality for most is you get home, you can't afford that. Right. Um, now you've used it just a little too much. Now you've got a milk supply issue. Uh, because you're not, uh, you're not using the. You're not telling your body. Right how much we need to make. Right. Those, those prolactin levels are super kind Sensitive. of delicate, especially the first six weeks. Uh, They've really got to get way up in terms of their level for you to have that sustained milk production over however much time that you want to um, produce milk. So now we've got moms that are like, oh, just pop that little can open. Oh, and I got a nap out of it to boot. Right. Next thing you know, supply comes down, baby's hungry. Or other scenario is now I've put a different nipple in the baby's mouth that hits the hard palate, so oh. soft palate. Now baby gets nipple confusion. Doesn't even know what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. There's a lot. This is mm -hmm. um, interesting. First thing I want to say, and you agree, I think, is this is not the parents' fault that this is happening. No way. Right. No way. So who whose fault is it, or is there a fault, or is this just a natural epiphenomenon of putting a, a, a an easy solution? into people's hands. I'm gonna throw out an interesting villain. Oh, good. Is Con it me? Congress. Congress! Hey, you know what? That's low-hanging fruit. I'm, I'll it down, is. I'm down with it. But it's. But let me, let me tell you why. So in our country, and I think this has made a lot of the press lately, we have like four manufacturers of infant formula in this country. So- That's not many. That's not and very many. And I imagine many. they have big lobbying powers. Oh, big lobbying powers. So the they've recently changed their name probably because they don't look so because good. Because FIC it, wasn't working out for them? It, it was IFC. Oh, really? The Infant Formula. Formula Council or something. So now it's the like Infant Nutrition Associate. So they really oh, like softened the edges. It, right. Okay. There are four members of that organization. Four. 
four members. So can you imagine the dues if your club only has four members? Could you, could you, I could see the like table smoke everywhere, cigar right. smoke. They're like, they've got bottles of formula in a little <laughs> shot. They're just like, well, Bob, right. did you talk to Pelosi again? Because, right. or whomever, or whoever, right? Well, and the thing is, is that the McConnell. reason we only have four companies is because they do have a pretty tight lobbying hold. Oh. Now, the FDA will tell you. It's because, oh, well, we, we can monitor the safety here. Um, if there's a recall, we can we can get it out to um, Americans fast because it's made here. Uh -huh. we, there's quality control. And, you know, the government is the largest purchaser of formula for the WIC program. Uh -huh. um, and so it makes very easy for competitive bids because each state does like a bidding process. Florida, we're... Not different, but some some states only like will do one formula contract with one company. Florida, we do have more than one contract, um, but again, it's still pretty limited. You only have four options. Well, actually, three options because the fourth company is the one that manufactures all the store brands. Oh. So they don't go out for. We don't do um, competitive bidding with the with the reasonably priced uh, oh, product, only of the course. expensive product. So the reason that we only have these four is also because we don't let the other companies in. Why don't we let the other companies in? Well, that's probably a lot of just straight up competition stuff. Uh, but, and I'm very curious if anybody is going to point this out now that this formula is coming in from other countries, you're going to notice a lot of labeling differences uh -huh. in the formula that comes from, not just that it's in metric and it's going to confuse everyone. And I guarantee you, we're going to have some babies that get not formula mixed properly because oh, the label right. difference. So that is an FDA point as well. Oh, well. It has know, to be a standard. You can't of... have like all these different measurements, right? Mm -hmm. I don't disagree. But you know what? Our formula companies sell in other countries. That means they're making other labels for mm -hmm. these other. Well, I'm sure these other companies would love a slice ah, of our market. I see. And they'd be happy to throw a good old American label on there. Um, like a goat with an Uncle Sam outfit on? Totally. That would do it. Holding its baby. Holding its baby. Bad yeah. America. Yeah. And feeding it bottle to the floor so I don't overconsume the product. <laughs> <laughs> don't drink too fast. Um, but the, the problem is, is that the World Health Organization back in the early 80s came up, well, World Health Assembly came up with this resolution on how to make sure marketing wasn't going to be pervasive and destructive. Uh -huh. Not to limit use, not to limit anybody's choice, but to limit the marketing. Uh -huh. um, the United States has never adopted that, what's called code of marketing of breast milk substitutes. We don't. It's been, so every Congress since 1981 has had the opportunity to tighten it up so that the marketing goes down. And the reason I'm talking about the marketing is because um, interestingly enough, last month, April, month before, World Health released a report that was actually the research was conducted over a year ago. So it was before our crisis where they showed that they tracked in the United States 4 million social media ads for formula with over like two and a half billion clicks. Wow. So you're getting this nonstop. And of the reason they're marketing that way is because it works. So Parents are accepting free samples during pregnancy. They're going to pop it open. They're going to derail themselves. They're creating their own dependency, kind of like a, a drug dealer who gives you a little taste. Oh, you mean that little bottle with the easy to pop yeah. top that's free from the hospital? Right. Wow. So they found that the marketing was impacting so that for a resource rich country that we, such as the United States, we have way more than the expected amount of formula consumption. The assumption being we're always going to have population who chooses it yeah. or needs it, yeah. but that ours is way more than expected compared to other countries that do limit the types of marketing. This sounds like opioids, doesn't it? We totally. use 80% of the world's opioids. We don't have 80% of the world's pain. No. I mean, maybe we do because we've self-inflicted. we spent $55 billion on infant formula. Wow. I mean, it's like the largest market out of all the countries. Okay. So now I'm... I have righteous indignation about okay. the formula industry. I can see how this has been kind of indoctrinated into American yeah. public that wants something and is is seeing it on social media and it's 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 a hyper normal stimulus into right mm -hmm. into our brainstem yeah. that we are now very conditioned to want this. And they're also putting out those little tiny little subtleties of you're still a good mom. 
Oh right? yeah, I've seen that. Right. Yeah. So it's um, <laughs> who said she wasn't? Right. The marketing <laughs> company, it, 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 their marketing and their tactics are pitting us against each other. Oh, interesting. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't uh, shamings that happen or, yeah, yeah. or guilt. Tra- I'm, you know, yeah. I hope it's getting better. I mean, yeah. Uh, certainly, it's not going to come from me or the people I work with. But if the mom already has the expectation that I am not living up to what I'm supposed to be doing as a parent. Mm. There's very little I can say. Yeah, because that fundamental shame has been planted. Yeah, right. I can tell her all day long that she's a good mom. She's thinking to herself, she doesn't really she think doesn't, that. Yeah, she doesn't think that. Yeah, I'm reading the body language. Right. She's judging me. Right. I know, I know. And, and well, so oh, I, had, I, had a, I had a question about this because you have this, okay, you, you have this stuff happening. Oh yeah, this was my question. But hospitals are actually paid more, right? Or they're judged somehow on how much breastfeeding they encourage, et cetera. This has been a thing that's come up from time to time. What's the deal with that? So that's called adopting the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. Right. Baby Friendly Hospitals. Right. Only 25% of American hospitals are baby friendly. So um, now those hospitals have to purchase the formula. Right. They can't just accept the freebies to pass on to the parents. I see. Um, A a hospital that I worked at early on in my career, we had a whole closet full of formula. The reps knew exactly what they were doing. The the closet was so overfull. I couldn't fit other stuff in there. We're handing it out like, here, just take extra because they – it's all part of the marketing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're handing out the formula. Um to make room and it's free. It doesn't cost my hospital anything. I'll give it to you all day long. Cause who doesn't nurses who hand it out. And I worked at a hospital as well. Nobody ever hands it out to be evil. Right. You're told, Hey, give some of these free samples to the parents in case they need it. In case, in case, in case planting that seed of doubt ah. early on. Now the, now the pushback I've gotten is from nurses and, uh, baby friendly hospitals who say they're really pressured to like not they give are. formula. And... I think they are. And um, it's, it, well, they're the pressure. Well, from my experiences, you know, we have to push informed consent on the parents and that makes some staff feel as though I'm walking in there guilting her already. I see. But it's really, it's just the informed consent. I'll give you the formula, but do you realize it's going to reduce your milk supply? Do you realize it might oh, wow. do this? Yeah, do you, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's informed consent, but but it's fed. It's it's felt as it's felt as that, and I don't know how to not. I don't it's, know how to fix that. And that's a tough one. It is tough. That's because, tough because you're in a highly emotional state. You're yeah. very vulnerable. You're emotionally open, and then this happens, and just it's informed consent. You go to surgery. You understand that these right. things can happen. It's right. But, I, it's I, I you know, and I do hear a lot of criticism about baby friendly hospitals because. As well, same same yeah. thing that moms felt guilty. Okay, I don't know why they felt guilty. Did someone actually say something to them, or is it because this all the marketing and promotion that's being done? They felt guilty before they even had before a chance to try, chance. right? Especially wow. like I said, those those who maybe are coming from uh, a place of science or they know the research and it's not working, right? Oh my gosh, they they kick themselves even harder. I should have known better, right? 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 Man, you know, ah, and, and it's, it's so nuanced too, which, which is what I love about your approach. You, mm. you see it, you see it from that standpoint, even though this is your life's work, yeah. right? And especially because it's your life work, that's where the nuance should be appreciated. Right. So, okay, so let's then get to, we know, okay, there's the formula industrial complex, mm-hmm. there's, the, the bre- there's breast feeding. Right. What's the alternative? So from, you know, and I always would suggest to a mom, pump. It, uh-huh. If you think you, the breastfeeding's not working, pump. It's it's you're not throwing you're not throwing away that chance of building up your prolactin levels right, right away. Right. Try it out. You don't like it. All right, let's move on. Right. Um, but we've got donor milk banks. Ah. The Human Milk Bank Association of North America. Ah. And now we've got breast milk products. I don't know how else, I don't know how they call them. Synthetic. Oh really? Synthetic. Um, okay. And these places are they're startups. They're, they're begging for money. They're getting grants, but they're not funded. Why do we think that is? Oh. We don't want to fund, we don't want to fund a superior nah, product yeah. for an infant. Listen here, Bob. <laughs> mm, this is a wonderful 93. Uh, we need to stop these startups, see? Yeah. 
And so, um, so, so what? I mean, how do they synthesize? What, what, what's well, the science? For, so for the donor milk banking system, mm -hmm. it's just what it's, it sounds like. It's donor. Like. It Can I donor. make a withdrawal just for myself? You can't. Are, is there? <laughs> you can't. So you have to have you a cannot. baby. You have to have a baby, and you have to have a prescription. Oh. And if you're lucky, it's covered on your plan because I see. it's incredibly expensive. expensive. Of course it is. Wow. So we've is seen, it pooled milk or is it, is it pooled? I see. Pasteurized, uh -huh. tested. Uh -huh. A whole bunch gets thrown out upon oh. receipt for like E. coli, just dirty hands. Yeah. Um, so there's not a lot and the batches tend to go to those extremely premature infants. Yeah. We know that breast milk is going to reduce the incidence of neck. Uh, necrotizing, necrotizing enterocolitis, yeah. which is a big killer. Jinx. Jinx. Oh, well now we're both jinxed. You owe me a chocolate cookie. <laughs> It's filled with, I have formula filled cookies, oh. but it's goat formula. Okay, so lovely, yeah, lovely, so lovely, it's, all all good. Good. Um, it's all goat. Uh, it's all goat. All right. So, so you were saying you have to get, you get the prescription, you give it to the, for, the, the premature kids. Right. Yeah. And then, so there's not usually a lot left over for term infants who, for whatever reason could benefit. Um, I see. I have seen a few term infants get a prescription. So it's a donor, right? So nobody's being paid. Yeah. Um, we're relying on moms who have extra supply and or just want to do a good deed. There's a minimum deposit amount. Uh -huh. I think, you know, I can't remember the ounces, but they want you to you know, give a, enough. I mean, babies drink 24 plus ounces a it's day. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, Especially for women who are just like, I'm just meeting the demand. I don't really have any extra. My body isn't really meant to overproduce, ah, right? We're, yeah, yeah. I would, we're only really meant to produce as much for the as kid, our yeah. baby needs. So we've got the human milk bank system that um, you can't just walk in exact, you know. But now we've got these other companies coming up. They're privately owned milk banks. So they are doing a breast milk product out of donor milk. And then we have some new ones and the race is on, especially right now for a synthetic product that's, you know, it's really developed in the lab, but it's developed from human milk cells. Oh, wow. So science. Science. And, you know, arguably not going to be the same as direct because that milk can't possibly have the antibodies that right. I'm getting uh, into my milk, nor is it getting the environmental feedback from me having my baby on me and I'm producing what baby needs. But... It's human milk proteins, human milk macros. So it's, you know, it's better. And we're not, we're not investing as a nation in this. And I don't, and I, and I, I don't know because I haven't studied, it hasn't really been around much. So I haven't read too much on it in terms of any research. I mean, it's years well, away because first they have to develop a good product and now we've got to test it, right? You know, we, we talk about like agricultural subsidies and things mm -hmm. like that. Why isn't the government doing subsidies to actually develop uh Exactly. Effective breast milk analogs that are human based, uh, you know, and and then of course you'll have all the um, hippies will be like, that's a GMO milk. It's a GMO milk. In which case, well, go get to do something else. But th right. th there are options. But but so okay, so that brought up a question when you were saying about we're only designed to make so much milk. What happens when you have twins or triplets, which is increasingly common with fertility treatments, mm -hmm. et cetera? How how do you manage that? Well, if you if you have twins, you're you're going to be programming to produce double. Oh, so it'll happen. Sure. So, uh, you've from got, demand, from demand. I so see. you got, especially that's why we really push synchronous feeds for twins. Ah. You got two breasts, you got two babies, get that, that prolactin level up. Your body is going to respond because it's getting this double oh, wow. dose of demand at the same time. Um, triples and more, you know, it's a lot more complicated. You yeah. have to do some rotation. Very few would probably be exclusively directly Breastfeed, right. Yeah. And now, so back to pumping. Mm -hmm. So, so this is what this is what my wife ended up doing is mm -hmm. a lot of pumping, um, including at work and including at all of that, right. and in a fridge full of uh, breast milk that I was often delivering because in those days I was a much more present uh, parent uh, than when things went off the rails and <laughs> things got really busy. But because I was I, my hospitalist job had a, had a you know a certain schedule that allowed me. When I was home, I was home. Right. So, um, how how do you talk to women about pumping so that they maintain supply, mm -hmm. so that they, you know? Yeah, and I and I actually worked for a breast company as a consultant for a while, and it really opened my eyes. A breast company. A breast pump company. Oh, okay. I was going to say they make breasts. Where is this company? China. <laughs> China. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all locked down. I can't get my breast. Oh, I don't know. I'm still getting my breast. Yeah, oh, regular. well, you know what? There's regular. certain essential items. It's essential. That, yeah, I don't care what, what zero COVID policy they have. No. We're getting this. Breast is 
first. Bre- breast is first. Breast is first. Yes. So breast pump company uh, yes. that I worked for. And part of my job was to do any troubleshooting with um, the customers, mm. um, especially those who are exclusively pumping. They're like, you know, I, um, well, pretend it's your baby <laughs> mm. and you're going to feed it mm. as just as you would a newborn. You're going to newborn or get on that pump eight to 10 times a day, both at the same time, get your hormones levels up so that you can produce a full supply with a pump. And it ah. is possible. And a lot of women do it. Okay. By choice or by just, wow, the direct breastfeeding stuff did not work out. Right. <laughs> but I would still like to give milk and I, I my lifestyle and my job I can accommodate this. Yeah. And I will um, pump. Yeah. And I think it's a powerful option. Like you said, it, there's, it's not an either or thing. There no. are, there are options. Um, and I know, I, you know, and I, when I was doing the consulting, I would, especially it was during COVID. So I was doing all the consultations through Zoom and I, I had ER doctors and nurses and they're like, I can't take breaks for pumping, yeah. nor am I sure I really want to express my child's food right now in this in environment. In this hospital with COVID everywhere. Yeah. Right. You know, just before we knew a lot about it. Right. So having to be able to problem solve, like, how do we make this work? And right. there's, there's some pretty cool ways that, you know, that, uh, that we can make it work. It's a lot more work. Yeah. Uh, some would say it's like twice as much work. Yeah. Right. Than just straight up breastfeeding. Right. So yeah. anyone's like, oh, just pump it. No, it's no, not easy. It's that hard. is a lot of work. You're relying upon a machine yeah. that could break. I mean, yeah. it, it can happen, right? So I put, uh, I made a video when my second was born in 2011 where I strapped the, bre- the pump to myself. And I, and did I, you turn it on? I did turn it on <laughs> and uh, it expressed a very serosanguineous flu. No, no, no. It was- um, That wasn't milk. <laughs> no, it was, it was kind of a joke. I did it as for this thing, but just even putting the thing on and doing all that, I was like, this is hard. This is- And it could be a real blow emotionally for uh, some women that I don't have my baby on me. I've that's got this right. plastic this noisy machine. Robot. Baby, mm-hmm. which is not even a baby, and it's loud. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, um, and so, so one thing I'm remembering now that that happened to my wife, and this might be worth talking about as we approach a little over an hour, and we should probably, we should. Oh God, there's so much to talk about, though. Well, we'll decide. The 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 the, the event of mastitis infection, yeah. and so she had that febrile Ooh. bad, wow. and that was the tipping point where she stopped. The, and this was one of our children, um, I think it was our first, where uh, just the style of this baby was to just be aggressive. And uh, so she was like, that's it. And then it was exclusively pumping. Yeah. Um, how do you talk about that kind of thing, Miss mastitis? Because it can be traumatic for women. They've never had an infection like that. Oh, it's horrible. Horrible, right? Really yeah. horrible, just really fast. Is that still your child's temperament? I'm just curious. <laughs> Dude, let's just say this. This kid is a mini me. <laughs> So yes. Cuz you know temperament and feeding there's new, there's some studies looking at infant's temperament, mom's temperament, mismatches of temperament of and how course. that impacts breastfeeding and the feeding relationship. You know what's funny? Okay, all right, all right. Now you're really getting me started on this. <laughs> so so because this is where I'm I get real interested in how you put human beings in a context. Right. It's all relational. Everything sure. is relational. Mm-hmm. And uh which is why I like I like talking to you because I can feel that you're a relational person. You're not you're not absolutist, you're not dogmatic, you have strong opinions, but you put them in context. So my wife to this day has this relationship with the youngest that is this fire and brimstone kind of relationship. It's actually wonderful in, in, in many ways because they, they're they actually really tight, but it's just like, whereas I'm, I see her and I'm like, that's just me. Like, girl, I know how to talk to you because I know what you're thinking. Right. I know how you're seeing this right now. You're making it all about you, mm-hmm. right? Whereas my wife is much more, she has a very even going temperament. And, and so- even at the breastfeeding stage, it was like, oh, this kid is just and wrestling just match. Wrestling match. And and you could feel it energetically. You're yeah. like, oh, these two are are at, you know, whereas I take the kid and, and I was like, oh, hey, mini me, like the, you and me. Whereas the second, it was the opposite. Sure. Yeah, they were so alike. And uh, so I think that there's so much to be said about that yeah. or to felt feel about that. Yeah. And, and in my role, when I'm training providers, we talk about, making sure you're educating the parents on temperament, Mm. goodness of fit, Mm. how it impacts, you know, everything from feeding to getting that child ready for school to, you know, once they get into (laughs) their teen years. (laughs) The inevitable, I brought Bobby over, he's my boyfriend. No, he's not. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. And learning that early on 
is it helps parents just be successful at parenting overall. Yeah. Aside from the feeding issue, but it that is usually the first place we start to see those struggles. It it was feeding it, day one. And 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 what's interesting is. Um, the the child's temperament and personality is so inborn. You know, we mm-hmm. talk about you know nature versus nurture. I think we can we can stop that discussion when it comes to personality. Right. It's the minute they come out, you know who they are. Yes. And my second came out, I was like, I know who you are. First came out, I know who you are, and I it know. hasn't changed. Same. Yeah. I mean, you can develop the lines and levels of those sure. personalities. You can grow them. There's all kinds of stuff. There's spiritual growth. There's emotional growth. There's psych psycho uh, physical growth. There's all kinds of stuff, but they come out with that. This you is... cannot change a child, child's temperament nope. at, at all, but you can adapt to it. Yes. The way I adapt, I just squeeze the hell Get the stress out. out of this thing. <laughs> I've been doing it actually while you've been talking. Just, it's oh, also good is... for, you know, for any carpal tunnel, oh, yeah. forearm yeah. strengthening. Yeah. 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 This is great. It's, it's, it's a multi-purpose tool. You know, when I deal with administrators, I have to work on my backhand because, you know, and this is right. a real, it's a real good thing. Just take that with you. They just will want you out of their office very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, I'm, I'm glad you wanted to call this meeting about HR and my my behavior on the wards. A um, couple things, uh, just spitballing here. <laughs> so, all right, so let's see, let's recap. We talked about benefits of breastfeeding, yeah. how formula works, how it was developed. We talked about now, okay, maybe we can end or wrap up unless there's anything else which you'll fill me in on on why we're in the formula crisis now. Right. Well, what happened here? Well, part of it is because we've only allowed these four, four. companies, um, the the Abbott Labs, which is the one that uh, got shut down, probably has one of the larger contracts with the government. Um, most, most of the people who are reliant upon infant formula participate in the WIC program. Ah. So they're already uh, at risk for all kinds of issues and now, if I was, uh, if I was like a mom and I was choosing to formula feed, just my type of personality, I would find what my baby liked and I would have a stockpile. Yeah. But that is expensive. Yeah. And WIC, we limit you to you're only allowed to buy this much per month. Right. You can't go stockpile for hurricane season or the next disaster that's right. going on. Right. Um. So they, you know, so people were left stranded so when. It shut down. And because they, you know, the longer you get away from birth, the harder it's going to be to bring back any lactation. Mm. And that's not overnight anyway. That can mm. take weeks. Mm. Um, so that's that wasn't even a, an option. Option, right. Maybe if, if you were newly postpartum, maybe you were doing a little combination feeding. I did have a, a friend of mine who was already getting to the six month mark. And she's like, should I should I ramp up because I'm doing a little mm-hmm. bit of should I ramp up the pumping? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, good time yeah, to do you that. Yeah. And here's how and, and be able to help her through that. Um, you know, but for the other parents who that is not an option, there was like no option. We were, you know, AAP had come out with with the thing saying, you know, eh, depending on the age, maybe we can just do cow milk for a little bit. I mean, what are you gonna do? You mm. gotta feed the baby. You know what's interesting? So when when my mom took me to India when I was six months old to be with some family there, and uh, I don't think they had formula and something had happened. And so I started getting cow's milk. My mom still to this day will say, oh, I feel really bad. They just, they gave you cow's milk. I still feel bad. Like you could have been like, you know, yeah. instead instead of Berkeley, you could have gone to Harvard. Like what happened? Right. Um, but But it was like, there was a lot of like, what the heck, you know? Yeah, and I mean, already- and look at me now. Look at you now. I, I'm hideous. <laughs> <laughs> it was the GI attack of it, cow milk at your was. infancy. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've already seen parents who were desperate and their babies have been admitted to the ER. We, you know, oh. we are seeing those stories. With homemade formula type things? Or just straight up cow milk. Straight up cow milk. So what, what, what happens when you give your kids straight up cow milk? Is it just an allergic kind of? Uh, it, it total inflammatory. They're yeah. going to launch into severe diarrhea and easily dehydrate. Oh, oh. so I, what I'm hearing is weight loss approach for obese children. I mean, I know for me, if I've been on, on milk, uh, I'm probably going to- Yeah, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm gonna Lactose flatten, intolerant. Yeah. Flatten out my stomach a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, for an infant, that happens really, really quickly yeah. and can be very dangerous. Dangerous, very dangerous. Although also, the, there's not the vitamins and yeah, the brain support the needed for the, for the brain development is not in straight up cow milk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Cat's milk though. I mean, who's done a study? Maybe that'll be my doctoral project. <laughs> oh man, get that PhD on the, oh, cat milk. It's just gonna, 
Wow. Feline feline lactation as a alternative source of infant nutrition. How am I going to randomize that though? Who's going to sign up? Random to, Randomize to cat or goat? I don't know. <laughs> it's, Who's going to sign up for that? It's half of one and two thirds of another. Yeah. <laughs> but I... You know, but at the end of the day, I, no parents should be demonized for their feeding choice. Thank you. But we also need to make sure that we don't set them up for failure, which is what we're currently doing. We're Thank not you. offering you paid leave. Yes. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to just tell you for nine months how good breastfeeding is. And then I'm going to basically give you absolutely no map of how to get there. Awesome. Uh, we've allowed the World Health Organization code of marketing to go ignored in this country since the early 80s, which... We know the marketing influences decision-making early on and probably leads to an increased use where it really wasn't necessary. Well, and we know that because the United States has resources and yet we have overly high mm -hmm. formula use relative overly to Overly high other. for what we should, where we should be. And part of it is the marketing. Part of it is our leave policy. Right. Um, you know, it's there, all the things. There's many factors. Contextual. Yeah. Absolutely. The whole web of it. Yeah. Again, that right brain seeing the big picture, the left yeah. brain reducing it to parts which oh, you need both. You do, but, and I will say that states are starting to get little bits of clues. So this past legislative season in Florida, um, a bill was proposed and passed to have finally have Medicaid cover donor human milk. Oh, uh, wow. Our governor signed it. That's it's great. It's now in law. Why did that take so long though, right? I mean, th those who are on Medicaid are, are arguably are the highest risk when it comes to yeah. health and infant mortality. And we're just now getting them what they need, uh, at least for those high risk babies. Cause again, we don't have, you know, an abundance um, of donor product. I wonder what uh, ways to increase the incentive to be a donor uh, lactating mother that doesn't harm your own child. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, so there are for-profit milk banks. They mm -hmm. do tend to pay people. Mm -hmm. So if I am a mom who needs money, I might be tempted to sell it and take the free formula at WIC. And yeah. we know that happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, but on the other hand- So bad for their baby, good for, yeah. Right. So that's going to need- oh, Sorry, not, sorry. Let me, re, let me rephrase what I just said. Not bad for their baby. Worse than the than other alternative that was there, which was right. her own milk. Yeah. So we've seen an uptick of people selling milk on the internet during right. this crisis. Right, right. Canada, Canadian Pediatric Society, I believe, was did a little a little study, and they they bought breast milk off the internet in the United States, oh. and like seventy four percent was contaminated oh, or Lord. had cow milk mixed in. Oh or wow! All kind of bacteria. Just top CM it off a little half and half. CMV. I mean, it oh was contaminated gosh. all kinds of stuff. Oh my gosh! So, but you know what? Desperate times call for desperate, desperate measures. measures. And if I was a new parent. And my baby was starving and I found a good deal on eBay I, yeah. and I didn't know any better. Of course. What are wow, you going to do? Wow, man, this is bad. It is bad. And, but, and you know, and you can't fix things during the crisis, right? We're learning that from COVID. Oh yeah. You got to get through it. And then we need to like take a hard look at our public health policies, right? But same with this crisis. Let's get these babies fed. Yeah. And then let's not get back in this boat. Let's yeah. start looking at funding the alternatives that are out there, the donor milk, strengthening the, the milk bank system, maybe putting some developmental money into other products that, you know, are going to be nutritionally superior to what we have right now. I love it. And, and this is a good way to wrap up. Last thing I'll say is how would a new mother get in touch with a good lactation consultant who can help? So um, a lot of us belong to an association, but if not, you can go to the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners. Ooh. All right. Or it is ICBLA. A, it, it, ICBLA. <laughs> uh, or you can also go to the the uh, U.S. Lactation Consultant Association, U.S. ILCA, and do a search for your area. But most WIC programs have lactation on staff. That's ah. one of the program components. Got it. Contact, and if you don't, particularly uh, qualify for WIC, chances are that WIC lactation consultant knows who else is in the community. Most hospitals have a lactation consultant. Contact wherever you gave birth, contact your pediatrician, your hospital, or your local WIC program, and we can we can make sure you'll find somebody. I love it. Mirani Ritchie, this was a fantastic conversation. I'm glad. I really enjoyed it. I learned so much. I'm de-stressed. Like when we started, I was like, we're talking about breastfeeding. I have strong feelings about this. And right. afterwards I'm like, I've learned so much. Right. So that is the, uh, the, the compassionate conversation, but also the stress ball. <laughs> it's really this. Guys, what do you think?
Does it suit me? I think it does. You know, male uh, gynecomastia is yes. a is a heartbreaking condition, and um, I don't mean to make fun of it, but boy, I don't look terrible with a boob. I'm, you know, at least now you've you've put that in your head so that if it ever happens, it's not as scary. I've destigmatized. Exactly. It's the opposite of what the formula companies are doing. Right. Uh, on online. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a supporter in our supporter tribe. Absolutely. Too. So, it's my pleasure. Oh, it's a joy. So <laughs> such a joy. <laughs> Guys, if you want to be cool like her, join our supporter tribe. If you want to be cooler, sh just share this video because we can actually start to advocate for real mm -hmm. change within the formula industrial complex of the United States. Absolutely. And if moms are out there feeling guilt or shame, don't, but you but educate and learn and do the best thing that you can right. to make sure that baby is fed, period. Absolutely. I love it. Thank you. Thank you again. And we are out. Peace.